Hi everyone, and welcome back to our final discussion of Unit 1, Chapter 7, focusing on posture. So now that we've kind of built up to this point, this is the last kind of essential component uh, dealing with the body positioning and body size specifically, is how do we actually get to posture? So posture typically, when we're discussing this, is going to be how we hold our body in an upright position. Um, but we weren't always upright uh, kind of creatures. Um, posture had to develop as we evolved as a species. So when we move from quadrupeds to a bipedal hominid species, there were a couple adaptations that had to occur. First, our vertebra had to adapt for vertical weight bearing stresses. This meant that our spine went from this kind of C shape, like what you would see in like a cat or a dog, to an S shape. So we have these curves that are going to create support. Also, when we have an erect posture, this is going to place an extra burden on the pelvis because everything has to run through this particular area. So this pelvis started to create more upward angled base and shape. This also means that our foot shape had to change. So it went from a grasping appendage to a weight bearing appendage. This means that toes had shortened and the remainder of the foot lengthened. Finally, our vertebra also had to take on a wedge shape. Um, to prevent excessive bending and twisting movements as we stood upright. Unfortunately, though, when you have this wedge shape, it's going to put excessive stress on the lumbar spine. This makes it prone to herniated discs and other overstresses, and it puts our sacroiliac joints or SI joints um, in a, uh, more prone to injuries. Next, let's talk about how posture changes as we grow. So, when an individual is born, there's going to be two primary vertebral curves. Uh, the first major curve is going to be the thoracic curve, and then you'll have a minor curve at the sacrum. Then at around six months of age, a secondary curve is going to start to develop in the cervical spine. This, is go this curve is going to be the result of an infant starting to learn how to hold their head up in the by themselves. Next, as the child starts to stand and moves to an upright position, the second secondary curve, the lumbar curve, is going to start to develop. By around age six, there's going to be two well-defined sets of curves, one primary curve uh, being the uh, thoracic and sacrum curves, and then two secondary curves, the cervical and lumbar curve. When you pull all four of these curves together, it makes an S shape. So this is what this kind of looks like. So you can see the well-defined uh, thoracic curve in the baby, um, and then the smaller curve at the sacrum. As the infant starts to develop, you start to see that cervical curve develop by three years of age. You can start to see that S taking shape. And then as we move up to six years old and adult, it becomes more defined. There's also going to be some additional development with leg posture. So when an individual is born, their legs are going to be flexed and their feet are going to be inverted or turned in. Um, as an individual learns to stand, their feet are going to become everted and you're going to kind of have a bow-legged stance by around 18 months old. I kind of call this the John Wayne stance. They kind of saunter in the places, lots of space between the knees and feet are turned out. By the age of three, children are starting to learn how to redistribute their weight and their knees are going to become knock-kneed or start pointing in. Usually around ages five or six, once they've developed a good cadence to their walking, their running, um, everything starts to kind of straighten out appropriately. The next thing that we want to consider is how do we actually maintain our posture? So to maintain our upright posture, our body is going to use a couple mechanical properties of joints, ligaments, and tendons, as well as the muscles, and this is going to interact with the nervous system in the form of a reflex. This means that our posture is mostly going to rely on reflexes in our body, particularly our myoatic reflex. So how this is going to work is a joint is going to start to flex. It's coming out of its resting position. And this initial slack will be taken up by the tendons that cross that joint. So the tendons sense that there is something moving within this joint. At the same time, the muscle spindles that are attached to the muscles, which are attached to that tendon, which run across that joint, will be stretched. This is going to send an impulse through our muscle spindles into the spinal cord, and this is going to synapse with our motor neurons. 
This is going to say, hey, this joint has moved. This motor neuron is then going to activate the muscles after it's kind of had a communication with the spinal cord and cause them to contract to realign the joint. So you're kind of having these constant micro adjustments to your posture all the time. And they're just little meiotic reflexes going off that keep you in a good position. This reflex system though only works through the facilitation of the vestibular nucleus and the medulla oblongata and the regulation of the epipyramidal system within the spinal cord. So there's some higher level brain functioning allowing these reflexes to occur. So this ultimately leads to why does it matter if I have good posture? Well, we know posture is the relative arrangement of our body parts or our body segments, but as I've said earlier, this is typically us talking about how a person stands. So when we have good posture, the line of gravity is going to pass through the center of each joint, which is going to create the least amount of stress in our muscles, joints, and ligaments. So good posture is economically savvy for the energy systems in our body. This also means that we're going to be in a state of muscular and skeletal balance. And whenever we have poor posture, we're going to have a faulty relationship between these components of the body. We also know that consistently poor posture can lead to some permanently stretched or shortened muscle groups, habitual sagging of the body, and excessive energy use made, used to maintain balance in the body. So poor posture actually hurts our body. However, when we talk about good posture, what good posture looks like is going to be a little bit different for everybody. There is going to be postural diversity between individuals. And this kind of diversity is referred to as dysplasia. This is going to be postural diversity within an individual due to disharmony between different regions of the body. This can also be related to an individual somatotype. Now there are various different types of dysplasia, um, but dysplasia characteristics can be seen in many individuals, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is poor posture. Um, many people just kind of adjust naturally to accommodate for issues with proportionality in their body and they maintain their personal version of good posture. So if you look to the right, um, you have three different examples of someone realigning themselves to have the best posture possible for what proportionality their body has given them. So if we see on the top, we have dysplasia that's due to small hips and a large head. You have a larger mass on the top of the body and a smaller compensation on the bottom. You have to compensate appropriately. Um, you could maybe have dysplasia due to having heavier legs and a large glute muscle group. Um, this is very common in women who have large breasts that they tend to carry their head forward to help kind of minimize um, that issue to maintain good posture. So good posture doesn't necessarily always look the same. There is some diversity in what it looks like. So as I've already kind of mentioned, somatotype and posture are related but there is a strong relationship between posture, body type, and it's particularly with our ectomorphs and endomorphs. So our extremes in our somatotypes. So we know that ectomorphs, sorry, ectomorphs are gonna be more prone to postural deformities than any other group, particularly in the vertebral column. So very thin individuals, we're talking about things like scoliosis, um, uh, kyphosis, lordosis, things like that. Endomorphs, on the other hand, are typically going to suffer from leg deformities, and this is due to the additional body mass that they have to carry. Mesomorphs, on the other hand, typically are problem free, um, but you can also see some minor problems associated with aging and improper training practices. So all of this leads to issues with posture that we refer to as a postural defect. So posture is just another important self-selection criteria for sport and physical activity participation. So this means that athletes and coaches should always be conscious of our postural deficits and whether this can be a mechanical advantage or disadvantage for participation in that sport or activity. We have four main causes for postural defects, and this includes injury, disease, skeletal imbalance, and poor posture habits. So there are also, there's also an interrelationship between these postural uh, defects and the ability for us to work effectively within our body. Um, typically, when we talk about postural defects, we talk about them segmentally. 
So somebody has a shoulder that's out of place or hips are unbalanced or things like that. However, even though we look at them segmentally, these are going to impact other parts of the body. Typically, when you have a postural defect at one part of the body, there's going to be this zigzag counterbalance system that is going to move through the body and attempt to correct the posture defect. So for example, if you have a slightly elevated left hip, you tend to see issues in the right shoulder, which would then cause issues in the left side of the neck, which may also cause issues in the right foot. So you would literally have this zigzag of your body attempting to counterbalance itself um, to fix the posture defect. So speaking of our posture defect, sorry, postural defects, I do want you to kind of go in and feel very comfortable matching a defect with its definition. This may be a very good test question because I may ask about a defect or where a defect takes place. It may show up on this test. It may show up on the next test. Hint, hint, wink, wink. I would look into this. So this is on pages 108 and 109 in your textbook. The next thing I want you to consider is there's a difference between static and dynamic postures. So our static posture is just when a person is standing in equilibrium or balanced or they're being held motionless. This basically means that I am at rest or I am maintaining movement at the exact same speed and this is just my posture. Dynamic posture, on the other hand, is much more relevant to sport and physical activity because it measures the person's posture while they were moving. So even though we assess posture in a static state, posture really matters in the dynamic state, particularly with athletes. So if you think about an individual who is doing a deadlift, um, if you've seen a deadlift before, the bar is on the ground, um, it is elevated up by the plates that are on it, and you have to bend down and get in kind of an extreme posture to grab the bar, and then you have to stand up. There is a lot of different issues that go wrong with dynamic posture as we move through the deadlift, and lower back injuries are very common. However, if we were to just look at a person standing there, we may not see a muscle imbalance that could be uh, kind of exacerbated in a dynamic posture. So there, even though we assess things in a static posture, we're really more concerned about someone's ability to maintain a dynamic posture while they're participating in activity. Next, when we have injuries that result from static postural defects, um, this is one of the biggest uh, topics that individuals want to go and do screening assessments on individuals. So um, there are so many screening assessments out there for posture that we're looking for balance defects and all this sort of stuff. Um, it's very frequently studied. However, we have all of this data, and it can, but it can be inconsistent with both strong and poor associations between a static posture and an injury risk rate um, being documented. So someone may look like they have a fantastic static posture, but then we make them move and it all just kind of falls apart. However, despite these inconsistent associations, we still have screening procedures and posture interventions that are strongly recommended for athletes and other individuals. So even though our data um, and research has been a little bit inconsistent, we still want people to go through screening procedures and posture interventions just to kind of give us a baseline understanding and give us the best um, kind of baseline to go from when we start move, putting them through dynamic movements. Also, coaches need to keep in mind that despite what a screening tool may say, there's always going to be confounding variables out there like fatigue or environmental influences that can alter posture and therefore increase the risk of injury. I am going to quote myself here. I've said this to many an athlete in my coaching career, but fatigue makes the body stupid. So when you are going through and you may have the best posture when you're well rested and you're at the beginning of the workout, but if I've put you through a very challenging workout, you're going to fatigue and your posture is going to start to fall apart. When your posture starts to fall apart, then you start increasing your risk of injury. If it falls apart enough, you will get injured. I don't care how good your posture is when you started. Fatigue makes your body stupid. So just something to consider if you plan on coaching athletes. So how do we actually prevent these postural defects? Well, in order to prevent any minor postural defect, we need to play preventative uh, instead of reactive. So doing preventative postural training or prehab, 
as it's kind of mentioned in the strength and conditioning world, is suggested for all athletes along with their strength and flexibility training. So if you're asking an athlete to do strength training, they should also be doing some sort of postural training as well. Um, most of our postural defects occur due to overtraining or overtraining in a certain area of the body or some sort of discomfort or injury that's occurred to an area in the body. Um, this also matters whether you're an athlete that's a unilateral athlete or a bilateral athlete. So unilateral athletes are um, athletes that have a handedness to their sport. Um, so tennis or overhead throwing, you tend to have one hand that does the work and the other side to counterbalance. This can lead to a unilateral overdevelopment in those sports. So if you look here to the left, this is a cricket bowler or a essentially a pitcher for the game of cricket and you notice the left side of his body is severely overdeveloped um, particularly in the upper back region um, and that's just because he's a unilateral athlete bilateral athletes on the other hand so swimmers cyclists wrestlers they tend to see an anterior posterior curvature like rounded shoulders so instead of being able to hold their shoulders back they get overdeveloped in the chest or overdeveloped in the back and the shoulders round one way or the other um, so there's going to be a postural defect at some point. I also want to point out that a posture that is ideal for sport may not be ideal for the average person. So for example, I was a discus thrower in college, in high school. Um, I had very flexible shoulders and a very flexible back, but my hamstrings were in terrible shape. Um, so technically, if I'm looking at that as a posture, that would be a postural defect. However, that posture was really good for my sport. So just something to consider moving forward. So knowing that we have these defects, how do I actually assess this? So static posture assessment is typically assessed subjectively um, when an individual is in a standing position and you use some sort of rating chart as a guide. The most common assessment uh, kind of procedure is the New York posture rating test. Um, and I have the charts included on the next slide so you can see what this looks like. So here, um, you're gonna look at an individual who is standing in front of you. Um, you'll have to get 360 degrees around them. Um, and you are going to mark each of these different documents on a scale of five to one, with five being ideal posture and one being the most extreme uh, undesirable posture. Uh, we don't do half measures. It's either five, four, three, two, or one. Um, and then you kind of get a total score. So if you notice, like, say, this individual has a three, they have, maybe they have a tight trap muscle that pulls their head a little bit to one side or the other. Well, knowing that we had this the first time we did our posture screening, the next time I do it, maybe it's not pulled as far over to that side, and maybe I can now rank them at, like, a four. Now I know that I'm seeing improvement in my posture with training. So um, there's going to be certain desirable postures for high level sports performance. Um, I want you to take a moment. So that same two or three sports that I've been sprinkling through the last few chapters, um, go in and I want you to look at the important characteristics and important proportions for those different athletes within those sports. Again, be very familiar with two or three sports and their positions. Um, it's going to come back. And finally, how do we actually modify posture and technique to improve performance? So this kind of comes back to a point I've already previously mentioned. Coaches should carefully consider if a postural modification is important. Oftentimes it's not, but it's always important to consider. Um, if you decide that we need to modify an individual's posture, the first thing you need to do is modify any static defects that exist. Typically that involves stretching a tight muscle and strengthening a weak or dysfunctional muscle. This works best in pre-adolescence. It's much harder to correct with adults. And there's some adults you're just not gonna fix. Um, so, but you can work on getting to that point. So once you've fixed any static defects or improved them, if you can, the next thing to consider is coaches can intentionally introduce certain postures to increase sports performances. This is like forcing an interior pelvic tilt when running or sprinting to improve the drive angle of foot contact. Um, that is not an ideal posture when you're standing, but that is an ideal posture when you're sprinting. 
So now I'm intentionally changing somebody's posture. And then finally, I can take a dynamic posture and train it in a specific skill uh, sport. Um, so like tucking your chin when you're tumbling or sticking your head through the window and doing a power snatch. So now I'm not just changing the posture, I am now changing the dynamic posture. So there's kind of levels to this. It is also important to note that just because a posture is good for sports does not mean it's always a good posture. Kind of back to my similar story with being a discus thrower. So that's it. That's all of unit one. It's been fantastic working with you guys, and I look forward to seeing you guys back for our discussion in chapter eight and starting unit two. Bye.